I'm John Carter in Moscow. I'm now in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I'm John Carter in Petra, reporting from India. In Colombia. I'm John Carter. Today on the Carter Report, we have the man who is called the Adventist Maverick. He's a historian, a philosopher, a university professor, and a theologian. His 50 books have influenced millions. His name is George Knight. Welcome back to the Carter Report. Our special guest today is Dr. George Knight. George, we are honored and delighted to have you with us here today. Well, I'm really glad to be here, John. Uh, we just enjoyed what you said in the last segment, and we're looking forward to this segment. You wrote a book called, uh, I read it, I thought it was great. <laughs> uh, you're a prolific writer. Somebody told me you're the best read author in the Adventist church after Alan White. That's saying something. I'm not sure it's true, but it sounds uh, good. <laughs> I, I think it is true. You wrote a book called The Pharisee's Guide to Complete Holiness. Yeah. What was, what was all that about? Who were these Pharisees? Well, and, actually, and John... why do the Pharisees... Why do we resonate a bit with the Pharisees? I was, I was coming out of my own past experience. A lot of my writing... Of course. ...is to help me figure out... Where you've been. Where I've been. And where you're going. And where I need to and go. And why, you, why you're here. <laughs> and help guys like you figure it out too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because there's a Pharisee within the skin of, of each one of us. Well, we're born Pharisees. Yeah. And, you, and, you don't have to go to the seminary to be trained to be a Pharisee. Yeah. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? That's true. Uh, we come at it naturally. Yeah. It's, it's, it's born within us. Yes, of course. And, and really, you know, John, naturally... We don't want to go to heaven if we didn't help God out. This is right. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. God, we want, we got to do something good for God, don't of we? Of course, yes. Yeah, and, and, and that's how come, and I start out with the problem of sin, mm -hmm. because the Pharisee has to break sin down into little steps. Uh -huh. And so when you get a little step, well, you know, and you're closer and closer and closer. Yeah, a and closer. name for every sin. Yeah. And yeah. if you overcome all of those, then you're perfect. Yeah. Is that right? How'd you guess? Well, I've tried it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, got a, it's got a long history to it. Yes. So anyway, I, uh, I wanted to start out, because Paul starts out with the problem of sin in the book of Romans. Of course. And, you know, Romans is really the greatest book in the Bible. Yes. Well, except for some of the other ones. Yeah. But it's, it's one of my favorite. Good, glad, and merry tidings that makes a man's heart to sing for joy yeah. and his feet to dance. Yeah. Who said that? Beats me. Sounds ah, like Ah, <laughs> glad I got you on something. Yeah. Now, that was Tyndale. Okay. Tyndale. He said, good, glad, and merry tidings that makes a man's heart to sing for joy and his feet to dance. So I, I figured out, you know, we got a whole lot of Pharisees. They're not just Jews. They're all no, different. No, no. They're all different varieties. We're born Pharisees. You don't even have to be a Christian to be a Pharisee. No. Uh, I mean, a church member. Yeah. So I came across the radical concept that sin is love. Now that one gets you for a little bit, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Sin is love. Mm -hmm. Now just think about it for a minute. Did Eve sin when she took the apple or whatever the fruit was or before? Uh, before. Yeah, she had to. Yes. Something happened in her heart and mm -hmm. head. Mm -hmm. And after her heart went wrong, she reached out and took the fruit. What happened in there? I'm more important than God. I can rule my own life. My authority mm -hmm. is more important than his life, mm -hmm. uh, his authority. So I'm going to do what I want. It's this self-centeredness making, well, loving yourself at the very center of our universe. And all other problems come out of that. Mm -hmm. And you know, some people call this the new theology. I call it the new theology of the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. uh, what did Jesus say in Matthew 15, verse 18? Mm -hmm. That out of the heart... Proceeds. So in the, in the New Testament, Jesus never talks about salvation as becoming better and better and better. Mm. He talks about it as a death and a resurrection to a new way of life, getting a new heart and getting a new mind... and getting a new record in heaven. You're justified, declared righteous. Mm -hmm. and, and, and with this new heart, out of it 
comes a new way of life. And that's the second great revelation, that sin and law are the same thing. Say it again, George. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sin... See, we, don't, we don't, don't want any heresy at the Cotter Report. Yeah. Sin and what? Sin and law are the same thing. Mm. Now, remember now, sin is loving myself more than God. Of course. Loving myself more than other people. Of course, of course. So I can abuse God. I can abuse you because I'm the most important thing in the world, egocentricity, mm -hmm. and I'm proud of it. Mm -hmm. Some people think that the law is the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. I hate to tell people, but the Ten Commandments are not eternal. Mm -hmm. They're not universal. They were created for this earth. The Sabbath, for example. Of course. It was created for this earth. Yes, it was. Yeah, and then... Uh, uh, you think God had to tell the angels, thou shalt not commit adultery? Probably not. I don't think they were even equipped for it from what Jesus said. <laughs> and, and, and honor thy father. No, no, no. There's a little book in my library, two of them. One's yes. called uh, Spiritual Gifts and one's called Selected Messages. Mm. That the principles of the law existed throughout all eternity. Of course. But when people fell, when Adam yes. even fell, they had to be negativized. They had to be reworded for fallen humanity. Yes. And when Jesus was asked, what's the law all about? What's the great commandment? Uh, love. Love your God, to God with all your heart, yeah, all your mind, and, and your all your soul. And your neighbor as yourself. And love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. And Paul in Galatians 5, 14 says, the law can be summed up in one word, uh -huh. love. Mm -hmm. And then the real clincher is Romans 4, uh, 13, 8 mm -hmm. to 10. The law can be summed up in one word, and then he ties it to the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he ties it that, you know, thou shalt, uh, you know, treat your neighbor right. Yes, he lists yeah, five of the commandments yeah, right yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And so what we have is we have sin is love. It's loving yourself more than God, more than your neighbor. The law is love. Mm -hmm. Loving God supremely mm -hmm. and loving your neighbor. And what the Ten Commandments do is tell us four ways how we can love God better, and eight ways, excuse me, six ways how we can love our neighbor better. And so, uh, so, so, so getting converted is actually getting your love refocused. Mm -hmm. and, and love is the very heart of what Christianity is all about. So this is really, um, this is really what God would have us to understand. Yes. Hmm. You it's see, not just joining a church. It's not just joining a church. It's not lifestyle issues. And it's not it's, checking off a list. It's, it, and I, it's, I, I've done all these things, so I'm, I'm almost there. Yeah. Now, doctrine is important. Yes, it is. But it, if you can have all the doctrines. Uh, and go to hell. And still be lost. Yes, of course. You can, you can be a vegan. You know, I once met a vegan that was meaner than the devil. I mean, you can, you can do all this lifestyle stuff. You can have all the doctrine and still be lost. At the heart of Christianity is the love of God. Mm. And after that, then everything else has meaning. When it's seen within it. I used to teach young preachers because I discovered this in my own evangelism. If you can't preach a sermon, based upon the cross of Christ and the love of God, you don't have a Christian sermon. Absolutely. And I don't care what it is. Uh -huh. Tell me about the church, the nature of the church. What is the church, George? Well, there's several views. Tell me your view. Well, I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you one or two views first. Some yeah. people see the church You're as- You're gonna break me into it. As a structure, Yeah. you know. Uh, mm. Some structures are built from the top down, and, yes. and the guy at the top, he's in control of everything. Uh -huh. But the uh, uh, Greek That word, sounds a little bit like us, doesn't it? Um, sometimes. Yeah. Not in our best moments. No. No, we don't understand the nature of the church. Uh, the Greek word is ecclesia. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, Hebrew word is kaha, mm -hmm. and it means those that are called out. Yeah. It's, it's those that have been called from, from what the Bible calls the world from secularism, to find Jesus. And it's the fellowship of the saints. Yeah. Now, the, you know, the, the saints really need to be organized, mm -hmm. and so they form a local congregation. But you can see reading already in Paul and Timothy and Titus in there, 
that uh, you know they had supervising pastors, yes. and so they, they they created some Elders, organization. Deacons, yes, and and so like like in our denomination, the local uh, churches get together, they elect officers, and then uh, the, the the various churches uh, elect uh, somebody for let's say a, a conference, like a Oregon conference, uh, and then they can get regional and stuff like that. But authority is always in Christianity. It's always from the fellowship of the saints. And the people at the top are not masters, they're servants. Well, that's how it ought to be. Well, that's how, yeah. That, uh, uh, yeah. Now, that's the biblical picture. Yes, of course. I can, I can see you got a hook out there. No, that's no, how it no, ought to never, be. George, <laughs> never. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very frank with you. Uh, uh, Lord Acton had a great saying. Yes. Power corrupts, absolute, absolute power. power tends to corrupt absolutely. Yes. And, and uh, you know, when you have authority, when you have responsibility, it's easy to think that, well, I'm more important because I have a position. Not from the biblical perspective. Not at all. The person at, all. at the, uh, the greatest, Jesus said, shall be your servant. Yes. And so, we, we, you know, we have a hard time with these things. And even I personally, I, I, I rescued an institution, and after five years of being the chief administrator, I felt I owned the place. <laughs> It's human nature. <laughs> it's human nature. Uh -huh. But you know what? That's what God's trying to work out of us. Of course. Yeah. So, so the church is the church is not really an institution, is it? Or, not from the biblical perspective. We're talking about from the biblical. From a perspective. sociological perspective, it is an institution. Mm -hmm. From a religious perspective, it's the fellowship of the saints, those who have been called out from the world. It's the ecclesia. Yes. And that's what really counts. And what holds the church together is mutual trust. And love. And love and based upon biblical truth. And not too much dictatorship. <laughs> I don't think that Jesus would have gone for too much dictatorship. No, I don't think so. No. Seems to be the very opposite of the kingdom of God. No, you do not have a church if you don't have mutual trust, mm -hmm. the love of God, and based upon clear scriptural principles. So you can't coerce people to do something which is uh, uh, anything. And you, certainly you can't coerce people to do things that are unbiblical. Well, you can force people to be compliant. And conformist. But you can't force them to have Christian unity. Yeah. Uh, one little old lady said at one time that that only comes from Christ-like forbearance. She said in that same passage that you can pass resolution after resolution after resolution and you will never get unity. Mm. Only with Christ-like forbearance and care for one another. Mm. Then all of us, including church leaders, ought to think about these things very carefully. Very carefully. The very nature of the church. That's right. The basis of the kingdom of God. And, and what it means to be, uh, well, you know, some churches call them presidents, some people call them bishops. Yes. What, what it means to hold office, hmm. and that is to serve the body. Yeah. Um, we comfort ourselves by a statement from a very important person in the Adventist church, Alan White, um, that when it appears as though the church is going to fall, it doesn't fall and the church goes through to glory. And so some people say with great enthusiasm and confidence, uh, whatever really happens, it's predestined to go through to glory. The whole caboodle, everything, everything's going to go through to glory. Um, is this biblical? Well, I think it's a misconception of the church. I think it must be. I, I think if you really, John, you and I have studied these things our entire life. Hmm. Which is not that long. Well, it's been a long time for you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes right down to it, what, with what the Bible calls the latter rain. Yes. And, and the pouring out of the spirit at the last days Mm. Things are going to happen that we haven't seen happen since Pentecost. Mm. My guess is that when the final events come true and, 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 and really get to be fulfilled, 
there's going to be millions of people trying to rush into the church. Yes. Oh, those people were right after all. Mm. And there's going to be millions trying to escape. And there's going to be so much action yes. that the administrators and the bean counters won't be able to count it. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to implode and explode well, at the same time. What's going to go through is the church of God. The people of God. The people of God yeah. in the biblical experience. Yes. There's not going to be anybody that can sit on top of this thing mm. and say, wow, look it, now we've got 200 million, we only had 20 million. <laughs> so, so we're not talking about the church as we're a... We're talking about the biblical church. Uh, we're not the sociological church. Uh, and I've read where you've said the church is the visible and the invisible church. That's right. So we're basically talking about the, the invisible well, church. And, uh, and you know what the problem with the invisible church is? Mm -hmm. Nobody can count them. Yes. You know, you yeah. know, you know what I And their names are uh, in, you know what I in said? heaven, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you know what I used to say? Trouble with Adventism all started when I learned how to count. <laughs> they count everything. Yeah. But you know what? Mm -hmm. You can't count the most important thing. Of course you I can't. I can't quantify your spirituality. No. I can't quantify how you love Jesus. You can't quantify I, love. Yeah, I can't quantify love. Yes. I can't tell you who belongs to the heavenly invisible church, but I probably can tell you who belongs as a member of the local congregation of this or that yes. denomination. Is it not true? And uh, we know this is no, true. Oh, by the way, John, mm. The invisible church has members in every, what we call, of course. denomination. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ellen White said that, didn't she? Yeah, uh, she said I mean, the, the, the most were in the Catholic church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have to remember this. You know, we, we may have what we call a remnant message. You know, Revelation yes, uh, 14, 14, the three angels' messages. Yes. That's a message to be given right before the coming of Jesus. Mm. I wished a thousand denominations were preaching it. Absolutely. I happen to be where I am because I only know one denomination it is. Uh, me too. Is it not true that the children of Israel, the Jewish people, they were the remnant people in their day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they were proud of it. And they thought that God couldn't bring about the Messiah without them. Yeah, without their keeping the law. Uh, yeah, but not only not, not only keeping the law, yeah. but he couldn't do it without them. Yes, of course. Yeah, they were important. Yeah, and they were perfectionists. Yeah. And they believed that the prophecies taught that they had to go through to glory. That's right. Uh, is, could there be a parallel between those people and, and some of us today? I believe that the parallel is frightening. And uh, just give me a, a couple of illustrations here. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll just give you one. Yeah. Um, well, I'll give you two. All right. John the Baptist looked at those Jews, mm. and he said, God can make rocks out of Jews. Mm. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he can, you know. He said he it. He said it. Yeah. Mm? Yeah. I mean, he can make Jews, you know. Anyway, my guess is, that God had to bypass them, he could bypass us if we do not stay faithful to him. So you don't believe in predestination, do you? I believe in predestination that God chose Israel and um, God has predestined those who have accepted Jesus oh, Christ by faith. Uh, what that, I'm, is, uh, that is Romans predestination. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is some have the idea that here is the church yeah, and the church is predestined to go through to glory. This is talking about the institutions and yeah. everything that belongs to it. Uh, that's a million miles from the truth. Yeah. Well, you know what got me off on this? And I was, mm -hmm. I was a seminary student. I read a little book called The Selected Messages. Yeah. Uh, you know, we always mm. talked about the final days. It'll go like fire through the strubble. stubble. Stubble. Just yeah. go like a blaze. And the strubble too. Yeah. yeah. You, you know what? Mm. Nobody reads the context. Mm -hmm. She says, the angels will be finishing the work and we're going to be wondering what's happening. Uh -huh. God has a million ways yes, he has. to finish the work of mm. the gospel on this earth. Okay, what is the mission of the church? The mission of I'm the talking especially about um, the Adventist church. Okay. And we could make it broader to include other religions, but what is the mission of the church? as portrayed in the Bible. 
to help people know Jesus. Uh huh. That's the primary mission of the church. Yeah. I would like to suggest that the church has an eschatological mission. Tell me about that. Well, that's spelled out in, in Re- Revelation. I'll be more comfortable, I think, with that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the eschatological mission of Revelation. Is that is Revelation 14, 6 to 12? Yes, and, and in verse 14, you've got Jesus coming in the clouds yes, of heaven. Yes, indeed. So we are looking at the last message to be preached on the earth. Yes. And it starts out with the everlasting gospel. That's the first part. Oh, every other Revelation teaching. 14, verse 6. Yep. Every other teaching of Revelation 14 is in there. I'm just going to open gonna, it up, John. Are you going to read it to us? I'm going to read it, yeah. What's the translation? This is the revised standard. Uh-huh. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel. That's how come, because the gospel is foundational. And it's eternal. And it's eternal. It's not it, a new gospel. It never changes. No. Never changes. Some people think in it's the last days. It's not dispensational. Day, some people s- think in the last days there's a different sort of gospel. No, and some people and think. And there's going to be a different sort of last generation. And some people think that of the Old Testament too. Uh-huh. They were saved by works. No, they weren't saved by works. Mm-hmm. Abraham's their father. He so was saved the, by grace. It's the everlasting gospel. So the, to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tongue and mm-hmm. tribe and people. I mean, this is going to be a worldwide Mission, yeah. he said with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Yeah. Now, some people have really got it messed up here. Uh-huh. The judgment is not against us. No, it's for us. The judgment is for uh-huh. us. There's nothing to fear in the judgment. One of these days I'm going to write a book called Judgment <laughs> is Gospel. How many books have you uh, written? 50 and I've edited another 48. Uh, so about 100. So you're going to write another book. Oh. Yes, why until not? Until I croak. Yes. <laughs> But listen to this, John. Yeah, I'm listening. It it gets better. Yeah. For the hour of his judgment is coming. And remember, unless you're uh, knocking off banks and abusing people, you're going to love the judgment. I mean, uh, uh, all the way through, it's the judgment, the judge. It's a vindication. So loved the world that he gave his only son. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. And worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Wait a minute. Where'd that come from? Oh, that's the fourth commandment. Fourth commandment. Well, that's good enough for Jews to keep the Sabbath, uh-huh. right? Yes, it is. Yeah. But where did where'd the fourth commandment come from? Mm-hmm. Genesis 2. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. God gave the, ten, the Sabbath to all mankind. Of course and that's he did. what Jesus says in mm-hmm. Mark 2, Sabbath 26 and 27, yeah. or 27 and 28, mm-hmm. that the Sabbath was made for the Jews. No, made for man. Yeah. <laughs> Human beings. Yeah. Anyway, at the end of time, the Sabbath will be important. And then you come to a second angel, fallen, fallen is Babylon. Babylon mm. is confusion. Yeah. And you know what the confusion is? Mm-hmm. Tell me. Confusing the words of men and women with the words of God. Of course. Every, mm-hmm. every teaching, That's everything the that I believe of, essence of Babylon. must come out of Scripture. Yes. And if it's not taught clearly in Scripture, it is not a doctrine. Now, I've got to ask you this before you go further into this exegesis, <laughs> because I can feel an exegesis coming. Oh, out. yeah, I could go for about two hours on I'm this, I'm sure you could, <laughs> just for one verse. What are you most grateful for? I'm grateful for Jesus. Mm-hmm who came and thought enough of somebody like me Mm -hmm. and you to give his life that I might have life eternal. Mm -hmm. That's it. What about your wife? Are you grateful for her? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I want to But you see, she's included in the package. Uh Uh-huh. When God's love Mm -hmm. gets in our heart, it overflows to other people. And you've had a great ministry. You've had a great life. You have a great life. Uh, Yeah. John McCain said when he looked back over his life, he had no regrets. You know what, John? I can look back and say the same thing. No regrets. But I have one saying. Mm -hmm. Plants grow best in manure. And I've been up to my armpits in it for 77 years. That's telling you something. Yeah. And and, and I'm tired of growing. I'm looking forward to getting home. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. I I, I wouldn't want to live another life. No. But I wouldn't want to live. But my you've life. been blessed, and you've blessed so many but people. Only George. because of what we go through, John. Yeah, we support your ministry a thousand percent, and we have a great empathy with you. This ministry, we believe in you. Thank you. We believe in what you teach. We believe in your books. We believe even in your philosophy. <laughs> uh, are you hopeful? I am very hopeful. Mm-hmm. You know, I love to. 
I, I preach funeral sermons in a red shirt. That seems to be slightly inappropriate. It, it, because a, a funeral red shirt? for a Christian uh -huh. ought to be a time of rejoicing. The next thing they know, yeah. they're going to see Jesus coming yeah, in the clouds I can, of heaven. I can understand that. You see, before I met Jesus, you know what I had? Mm. Beer. Yes. And the problem was, I always had to wake up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've got this hope, and I love 1 Thessalonians 4. We have this hope. Yes. Jesus is coming. So you've got the hope of glory. That's right. That the Lord is going to come. Amen. Uh, George, I want to say to you today, it hasn't been a privilege. It's been a super privilege. It's been good to be here, John. And a pleasure to have you with us. What you say resonates in my heart. Um, I've got a few of my team members sitting back there in the studio. They're all saying amen and they're laughing and they're having a good time because um, not only do our folks love you, uh, they like you. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and may I say to the audience, it's been a privilege today to have you with us. Thank you, George. You're welcome. Thank you. Write to me at the Carter Report. Till next time, God bless you and thank you. There's only one thing that really counts in this lifetime, your relationship to Christ. And then if you have a right relationship with Christ, you want to tell people about Christ. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. By the grace of God, we're going to do that. We are doing that. That is why we're going back to Cuba, to this communist land, to preach Christ. We're accepting an invitation to go to the, the vast, uh, huge city of Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Been there before, but by the grace of God, we're going back. Please support us. And please stand with us in the preaching of the everlasting gospel. You say, how do you do it? Who, who pays the bills? We do. Do you get any help, financial help? from the church. No, my friend, we don't. But we get a lot of help from God and from his children. Please support us in the preaching of the everlasting gospel. It's the most important work in all the world. Everything else is almost trivia. So would you please write to me? John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Do your best for Jesus. Do your best for the gospel. And uh, in Australia, write to me at Terrigal. And we promise you this, every dime, every dollar is going to be used to win souls to our Lord Jesus Christ. Please write to me today. Thank you and God bless you. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.